If you've been following me for a while, you know I'm a pretty open book. If you haven't, hi, I'm a pretty open book. I share things a lot of people probably wouldn't share at all, let alone with the entire internet. But for some reason, stuff around body and eating is particularly hard for me to talk about because it just feels so personal. I think it's because it feels like such an internal problem, which comes with all the shame and stigma of individual responsibility and failure. It's not like, this thing happened to me, it's, this is me. But I decided that I'm finally ready to share this part of my story. It's not pretty, but this is me. Before I do that though, I wanted to let y'all know that I just made a Patreon. The money I make as an artist is like wacky unpredictable, so having a more stable source of income would be such a huge help and would allow me to focus more on making things that feel true to who I am instead of commercialized art that satisfies the whims of the social media algorithm gods. So like, I can keep painting my emotional baggage instead of Billie Eilish for the rest of eternity. So if you have the means, please consider supporting me. Thank you, I love you! Okay, here we go. From a young age, I was made aware of my body and that it was flawed. I had a bit of chub as a youngin, and my parents would always point out my protruding belly, my roundness, my voracious appetite. People would euphemistically call me big boned. And I internalized it before I even really had a concept of self. I remember when I was seven years old writing in my diary that I was insecure about my stomach. Property of Jackie Lou, age seven and a bit more than three quarters, grade second. Note to person who is hopefully not stealing my information. Dear person that is not going to flip the page and is not going to read any of my diary except this part, I will be the only one welcome to read this diary. You will not, I repeat, will not flip the page. And that's on period. Best regards, but not best regards if you are choosing to read this diary, Jackie. Secrets. One, I hold my pencil the wrong way. When I hold it right, I feel weird and it's harder to write. Two, my belly is a bit big. Almost every time I'm in the shower, I look down and my belly is a big ballish looking thing. It wasn't just about fatness though, my body was also scrutinized in other ways. My mom would constantly shame me for being flat chested even though she's literally as flat as me. She'd be like, all I ever wanted in a daughter was to live vicariously through her boobs because I never had any. Which one, weird as fuck. And two, uh, genetics? Pony square hoomst? Once I wore a pair of leggings to school that I literally bought with her and she said I wasn't allowed to wear them anymore because I would get raped in them. Also, I grew up in a very Caucasian environment, not a drop of melanin in that town. So as a person of color in an overwhelmingly white space, I was never seen as attractive. I was never sought after. I felt like the fact that I wasn't a skinny white girl meant that I had failed at femininity and that somehow I had to compensate. I think she's foreshadowing. So throughout my adolescence, I was constantly told that my body was something to be judged, something to be ashamed of, something to be fixed. Right before ninth grade, I had my anorexia girl summer. I was fresh out of middle school, impressionable, and insecure. I've always had tendencies of excessive perfectionism, and I discovered that my body was another avenue to exercise them. There was also a lot of fuckery going on in my home life at the time, so I think I found in anorexia a mechanism for regaining power and control amidst the emotional chaos. I started systematically starving myself, and I was good at it. I logged what I ate, I counted calories, I made a game out of challenging myself to eat less and less. I also began to develop orthorexia, which is an obsession with quote-unquote healthy eating. For me, this entailed eating clean and whole foods, avoiding processed or artificial ingredients, and moralizing foods as good or bad. This imposed a new set of rules for self-restriction, while at the same time letting me deceive myself and others under the guise of health. 
eating disorder? Me? Nah, I'm just being healthy. But my body was like, healthy? Oh, that's goofy. I was exhausted all the time. I was always cold. Like 70 degrees felt like the Arctic tundra. My hair follicles gave up on me and I started shedding like a dog. My vision turned black almost every time I stood up and I passed out a couple times. Sitting hurt my tailbone because I had no ass and I ended up losing my period for two years. No period might sound kind of lit, but it will not be very lit when I'm older and I break all my bones from osteoporosis. Also, now my hormones and menstrual cycle are wacky as fuck. In college, my uterus was going crazy. I was getting my period like every two weeks. And once I even got it thrice in one month. Ultimately, by the end of that summer, I had lost more than a sixth of my body weight over the course of two months. And I probably would have kept going if it weren't for the fact that I realized that my annual checkup was coming up in a week. I was like, oh shit, I'm going to get weighed at the doctor's and my mom's going to find out. And my mom finding out was far scarier to me than the prospect of losing my skinniness. So for that week, I ate everything in sight. I ate constantly and frantically trying to gain weight back. But even after the doctor's appointment, I couldn't stop. I kept eating and eating and eating. And that marked the start of a very long battle with binge eating disorder. So in the general timeline of my eating disorder history, anorexia was the big bang, so to speak. But duration wise, it was just a little blip. Orthorexia was kind of here and there, everywhere, all the time. But the main hoe was binge eating disorder. Every single day for nearly four years straight, I would eat beyond the point of feeling physically sick. I would often eat so much I'd get heart palpitations and I wouldn't be able to move and sometimes I genuinely thought I was dying. Many times I was in so much pain that I tried to make myself vomit but physiologically I just could not. And thank god for that. The door to bulimia stayed closed. Like my epiglottis. Thank you body. She's looking out for me sometimes. On the regular. I would eat entire jars of peanut butter, entire boxes of chocolate, entire loaves of bread in one sitting. Once I ate five pints of ice cream in a couple hours. Another time I ate an entire Costco pack of 24 cliff bars in one day. You know those 10,000 calorie challenges on YouTube? For me, that would not have been a challenge. That's a daily vlog. My binge eating also fused with my perfectionism and fear of unproductivity in this weird way to create a new kind of yeast. At first, it started with the guilt of feeling like sitting down to eat was a waste of time. I felt like I had to earn food and use my eating time productively by doing homework, reading textbooks, watching Khan Academy. <laughs> Get a life nerd. So it started with not allowing myself to eat unless I was also doing work. But this created a dependency, so it transformed into not being able to do work unless I was also eating. I became literally unable to focus on studying unless I actively had food in my mouth. So like, if I spent six hours reading a chapter of my history textbook, I was constantly eating. The whole time. It was a vicious cycle. Doing work enabled me to eat more, which enabled me to work more, and so on. Frankly. I don't know how I didn't gain more weight than I did. I don't know if it was a genetic thing or a hormone thing or my GI tract working overtime, but somehow my body didn't deviate that much from my baseline before. And even though BMI is some unscientific bullshit, I technically remained within the healthy range, barely though. But so, other than some snarky comments about my weight from my dad, I luckily wasn't really shamed by others. But the internal shame? Sheesh! I was so, so hard on myself. I felt worthless and pathetic. I felt like a failure. Like my willpower was just too weak. But in reality, there were so many underlying factors contributing to the binging. First, it was definitely in part a psychological and physiological response to the deprivation from my anorexia era. My body was trying very hard to balance the scales, literally. 
and it was also very much exacerbated by a scarcity mentality. Let me explain. Quick segue, the evil stepmother. I met my now stepmom, then my dad's girlfriend, when I was in third grade. She did all the things to win me over. We got froyo together, curled our hair together, played video games together. I thought I loved this woman. I gave her presents, drew her pictures, all the corny shit little kids do. But the whole time, she was just performing in order to appease my father. My hypothesis is that she was a little bit gold digger, a little bit sperm digger, because as soon as she got pregnant with her own child and got married to my dad, she cut me off completely, like would not speak to me. If I went up to her to say hi, she would either pretend she didn't hear me or stare at me, say nothing, and walk out of the room. I told my dad, and at first he didn't believe me, but when it got to the point where it was so absurdly obvious that it was simply impossible to ignore, he blamed me. He would say it was my personality defects as a nine-year-old child, or that I was rude to her parents because there was a language barrier and I couldn't really communicate with them, or my favorite explanation, because you always forget to turn the air conditioner off when you leave your room. So true. My stepmom has not spoken to me since 2013. It has been almost a decade. For the first few years, it was just this passive hostility, which of course made me feel like shit, but I got used to it. But then, around the time I started high school, when I was like 14, she started being actively aggressive. I started noticing food disappearing. Like, if I took a bag of chips from the kitchen, the next time I came back, the entire drawer would be emptied. I started to suspect my stepmom was hiding food and hoarding it. Once I ate a packet of oatmeal for breakfast, and then the whole box disappeared. I asked my dad if he had seen it, and he couldn't find it either, so he asked my stepmom. And she said that I had fabricated the whole story to make her look like the villain. And then my dad came to me and was like, Jackie, are you lying to me? I don't know who to trust. And I was like, bro, what incentive do I... Do? Anyway, I kept looking for the oatmeal because I knew I wasn't crazy, and I ended up finding it at the very, very back of the pantry, clearly hidden deliberately. I showed my dad, and he called me slimy and manipulative. Once, when my dad and stepmom were both out of the house, I snuck into their room. This was really bad of me, violation of their privacy or whatever, but I was just desperate to confirm reality for myself because I was being so aggressively gaslit. So I took a little peek into my stepmom's closet, and lo and behold, so much food. Like fallout shelter type shit. She ready for the apocalypse. Oh, and this one time, my little half-brother accidentally narked on her. He was like four or five at the time, so he didn't know he was supposed to hate me. There was a bowl of washed strawberries sitting on the kitchen counter, and I took one, and then he leaned over to my dad and stage whispered, Daddy, mommy says Jackie's not allowed to eat the strawberries. So yeah, this bitch was trying to exterminate me. I think it's because she didn't want me going to their house anymore. I mean, I didn't even want to be there. I was just there to honor the divorce agreement, and because I felt kind of bad for my dad, and because my mom's house was high-key worse. But I think my stepmom viewed me as a threat, like another female person vying for my dad's attention. Kinda sussy, kinda Freudian. So that is my stepmother. And then my mother, oh my lord. In the spring of ninth grade, so this is a couple months after the binge eating started, I went vegan for ethical reasons, environment, animal welfare. To this day, I'm still vegan, because it aligns with my moral values and sense of self. But looking back, I don't think it was the healthiest choice for me at the time, because it ended up allowing me to impose even more stringent restrictions, even more rules to follow. And the fact that it was morally righteous allowed me to justify my self-imposed deprivation. My mom was very much not chill with my veganism for a whole host of reasons. She mainly expressed concerns about health because she thinks vegans are all anemic and protein deficient. But really, I think she didn't like the fact that I was my own person making my own decisions, and so she took it as a personal betrayal. For years, it was a huge source of conflict between us. At one point, she did ask said, you can choose to be vegan or you can choose to be my daughter. And I chose to be vegan. Ah. <laughs> She also said me choosing to be vegan contributed to her depression and me choosing to be vegan was tearing the family apart. 
and me choosing to be vegan despite her wishes meant I didn't actually love her. And if I was going to choose to be vegan and destroy my own health, I might as well kill myself. Clearly for her, it wasn't actually about my veganism. It was symbolic and a convenient target for taking out her emotional baggage on me. But for me, it was very tangible. This lady was trying to shove meat down my throat on the daily. And it did become symbolic for me too. It was identity and autonomy and resistance. But so she basically tried to starve me out of veganism by not buying me groceries. I would have to spend my own money, or my dad would help me out sometimes, or a kind English teacher would give me a jar of nuts to take home. I also had to cook for myself throughout all of high school. That's why you'll never catch me complaining about college dining hall food. I'm out here living in luxury. But yeah, whenever my mom saw me eating in front of her, she would berate me for eating too much, for eating the wrong things. So I hid from her. I had to sneak around in my own kitchen. I would wait to eat until odd hours of the day, and eating became an activity shrouded in secrecy and guilt and fear. I have not eaten a meal with my family since I was 14 years old. The point of this tangent on my shitty maternal figures is to say that all of this wackery combined to produce a sense of scarcity around food. Not literal scarcity. I grew up economically privileged enough to never have to worry about affording food which I am immensely grateful for. The deprivation was more psychological. Every time I ate, there was this sense of desperation, like it was the last chance I would ever get. The binging almost felt like a survival instinct. On top of all this, there were just a bunch of other traumatizing shenanigans going on in my life that I won't get into. Food was an escape. It was refuge. It was safety. For the fleeting moments when I was eating, I didn't have to feel. I could just forget the pain, just for a little bit. There was an emptiness inside me that needed to be filled by compassion and love. But I didn't have that, so calories were the best substitute. I'm doing a lot better now. Like, better than I could have even imagined possible just a couple of years ago. But it's not like one day I just declared I would stop binging. Because I tried that. Hundreds of times I told myself, this is the last one. And it never was. Binge eating is like a particularly tricky kind of addiction. Like take smoking, for example. Hypothetically, for the sake of the argument, you could quit cold turkey and never pick up a cigarette again in your life. But you can't just stop eating. So the line is constantly blurred. And even if the amount you eat seems objectively normal, it can just be a feeling of wrongness that sends you into a spiral. What finally started the healing process for me was actually the pandemic. Life slowed down, which forced me to slow down. And for the first time, I realized how stressed and burnt out and emotionally exhausted I had been. So in this new universe, with a new set of rules, I gradually pieced my life back together. This was also the time I started making art again, so a lot of spiritual healing all around. With time, the binges became less frequent. It went from every day to a couple times a week to a couple times a month, but it was a very gradual and non-linear journey with many relapses and a lot of seesawing between extremes, eating either way too little or way too much. This past year, the new environment of college definitely helped a lot. The physical and temporal distance from my past gave me the fresh start I needed to try and redefine my relationship with food. But I'm definitely still in the process of figuring shit out. I can't really do the intuitive eating thing. I've been so disconnected from my body for so long that I don't really know what hunger and fullness cues feel like anymore. So I kind of just try to eat the amount that maybe seems like it might be proper. <laughs> I'm working on it. And the binging does still come back sometimes, especially when I'm stressed. Like just a couple months ago, the night before my math final, I ate 13 of these vegan snickerdoodle cookies they have sometimes in the dining hall. I don't even like them that much. They taste like a combination of sugar, Play-Doh, and cancer. I woke up at 4am the next morning with a horrific stomach ache, 
and I was terrified I was going to shit my final in more ways than one. Anyway, I think eating disorders never really leave you. I feel like you can be recovered on paper, you can check all the boxes of eating normally, but the way you conceptualize food in your head is still messed up. You can still have disordered thought patterns even if they don't manifest in outward behavior. I don't think I'll ever be able to unlearn the emotionality, the punishment, the guilt, the power I've attached to food. I can't go back. But I'm trying my best to learn to navigate a new way forward. I learned something very recently that has given me a new framework for understanding all this shit. Just last week, I was clinically diagnosed with OCD and OCPD, which, according to Mr. Psychologist Man, apparently have high comorbidity with eating disorders. It explains a lot for me. The need for control, the self-imposed rules, the fear of unproductivity, the moral scrupulosity with veganism, the all-or-nothing mentality with binging, like, if I couldn't maintain total control at all times, I had no choice but to let it go entirely. I might talk more about my OCD and OCPD stuff later, once I've had more time to process. I don't know. It's all very new and confusing and unsettling, but in a way, it's also given me some closure. A lot of the shame I felt around my eating stuff stemmed from guilt about privilege. My eating disorders were born out of a context where access to food was a given. With anorexia, it was like, there's so much abundance that you're afraid to get lost in it. And binge eating disorder was getting lost in the abundance. So I was very, Kim, there's people that are dying, to myself, which just made me hate myself more. I think the dominant cultural image of eating disorder is still rich skinny white girl who starves herself for attention. This idea is harmful in a number of ways. Eating disorders are rarely discussed in communities of color, even though they're definitely affected. Anorexia, which is a serious mental illness, is minimized to just another manifestation of vanity and attention-seeking. And eating disorders other than anorexia remain unknown or misunderstood. Binge eating disorder is actually the most common eating disorder in the US, but I feel like it's barely talked about. I think that's because it's so stigmatized, and it's a lot harder to understand. The ugly truth is that anorexia is still somewhat glorified by society. With the constant bombardments of diet culture, and weight loss teas, and appetite suppressants, and the whole that girl trend, as women were fed the notion that our relationship with food should be restrict, restrict, restrict. Self-deprivation should be worn as a badge of honor. Starving yourself carries with it this perverse fantasy of a mastery of the art of discipline and willpower. I won't lie, when I was anorexic, there was this masochistic satisfaction in the hunger pangs. The feeling of control was addictive. At the very back of my mind, I used to find myself missing it sometimes. Binge eating, on the other hand, is seemingly the opposite. There's absolutely no control. From an outside view, The superficial tenets of anorexia are easily romanticized. Self-restraint, perfectionism, contorting into the dominant beauty standard set by a fatphobic society. But it's not romantic to be sitting on the floor of your room at midnight, eating peanut butter out of the jar with a spoon, and it tastes like chalk and it's sticking to the roof of your mouth and you want to throw up, but you just can't stop eating. Binging conjures notions of indulgence, gluttony, letting yourself go. But it's none of that. It's just another form of suffering. In the telling of my eating disorder story, I talked a lot about higher level external forces whose influence I could only really start to understand in retrospect. But the unifying thread of my day-to-day reality was a hatred of my body. The body is very hard to ignore. It's the medium through which we interface with the world. It's a convenient scapegoat for physicalizing self-hatred, easy to transform into a landscape for exerting control, for reflecting personal success or failure. I want to acknowledge that, objectively speaking, 
the body I inhabit carries with it an immense amount of privilege. I will never have to worry about not finding clothes that fit me, or being refused adequate medical treatment, or being denied access to certain spaces because of my size or my physical abilities. I am aware of my privilege. I am aware of the pressures of socialization, standards of beauty and femininity, internalized racism and fat phobia. I am aware of the many ways in which my childhood fucked me up. I am aware that worth is not determined by physical appearance, and bodies are just glorified sacks of meat, and the universe doesn't give a shit, so none of it fucking matters anyway. But awareness doesn't change the fact that when I look in the mirror, I'm physically repulsed. On a surface level, caring about physical appearance might seem shallow and vain. But as women, we're socialized to pursue beauty at all costs. The caveat is that we have to do so effortlessly. We're penalized for showing that we care about appearance. No one wants to know the shit that happens behind the curtains. Oh, you're on a diet? That's toxic. Oh, you spent hours doing your makeup and picking your outfit? That's stupid. Oh, you got plastic surgery? That's cheating. We're supposed to attain the ideals of womanhood without even trying. Visible effort diminishes the accomplishment, revealing the suffering behind the pursuit disrupts the placid fairy tale of beauty we're supposed to buy into. In reality, it is a fact that society treats you differently based on how you appear. It tangibly shapes the opportunities you're given, how people judge your character, how others treat you in everyday interactions. Those who hew closer to the ideal beauty standard reap the societal rewards. Beauty standards themselves are whack, unattainable, constantly changing, and deeply rooted in patriarchy, fat phobia, and white supremacy. Side note, it's interesting to observe the dichotomy between the opposing social pressures that tell men to get big, to become a high-value alpha male gigachad who can deadlift a pickup truck, but tell women to get small, to shrink, to literally take up less space. But still the fat ass, though. As women, the imperative to perform femininity is so pervasive that it infiltrates our thought patterns, our behaviors, our sense of self. Sometimes I wonder if we've been brainwashed to enjoy the rituals involved in the pursuit of beauty, which ultimately serves the patriarchy. For example, I love working out. I do it nearly every day. It makes me feel strong and capable and allows me to challenge myself and push my limits. The routine also provides a sense of stability and achievement. And the instant gratification of the endorphin rush is also a nice little bonus. But sometimes I wonder how much of the thrill is pure, unadulterated joy that comes from me, and how much of it is the sense of accomplishment from knowing I'm putting my effort towards supposed self-improvement. Improvement is towards something. It necessarily implies direction. But who determines that direction? Another example, I love doing makeup. It's so fun. It's like drawing on my face. It feels empowering because it allows me to express myself and feel more confident. But then I wonder, does the confidence boost come from within, or is it only predicated on attaining closer proximity to conventional attractiveness? Is it really just empowering because it increases my social access in a landscape regulated largely by cishet white men? Dude, man, I don't fucking know. I've been trying for a long time to find kinder and healthier ways to relate to my body. Body positivity is a movement that's been recently popularized, but I have some issues with it. All things considered, I think it's a net positive, and it definitely helps a lot of people. However, that's just gentrified. Its modern iteration has very much been commodified and sanitized from its original roots in the fat liberation movement. A lot of body positivity influencers are straight-sized people who are like, Look, when I sit down, my skin folds. I even have a stretch mark on my ass. Hashtag love yourself. This messaging insinuates that you should love yourself despite these flaws, which are often just parts of normal bodies that they are telling you are flaws. But beyond the more obvious problems of the Instagram girl boss version of body positivity, Its underlying premise still warrants scrutiny. Body positivity says you should love your body because every body is beautiful. But why should love for my body be contingent upon beauty? 
doesn't this still feed into the toxic notion that human value derives from beauty? And why should I even have to love my body? Can't I just exist? That's where body neutrality comes in. Its message is that the body should be respected and accepted for its functionality as an instrument, rather than loved for its beauty. I think it's definitely a useful framework, and is more accessible and inclusive than the discourse around body positivity. However, it also fails to address the reality that certain bodies are more privileged, and are treated more generously by society. Those privileged people, myself included, can more easily cultivate an internal attitude of detachment from self-judgment, because they aren't faced with structural barriers that directly result from the bodies they inhabit. Bodies that are marginalized, fat bodies, disabled bodies, trans bodies, racialized bodies, encounter constant discrimination, constant reminders of their devalued status in society. Even if you can control how you think about your own body, you can't control how the world reacts to it. The onus is on the individual to become a Zen master and stop caring about how their body looks, while they battle an external social reality where their body is continually scrutinized and evaluated. Both body positivity and body neutrality are underpinned by the concept of liberalism, which a lot of the white man philosophers really like, because they're privileged enough to be able to forget we live in a society. <laughs> liberalism sells the fantasy that we have complete freedom of choice, that we're individual agents in a vacuum, devoid of political and social contexts, relationships, hierarchies. The body positivity and neutrality movements both focus on changing the mindset of the individual, instead of dismantling the systemic forces that marginalize certain bodies to begin with. Because that would require collective action, and burning shit to the ground. My relationship with my body has definitely evolved. I still often feel deeply uncomfortable in my own skin, but it's much less all-consuming. I think I've been able to become less judgmental and more forgiving, and to gradually decenter physical appearance in how I conceptualize myself. There's still the self-hatred, which is obviously an issue, but it feels like a small victory that I've been able to shift the hatred of my body away from purely aesthetic factors and onto other things, real dysfunctions, like the fact that I can't sleep through the night without waking up to pee at least twice, or the fact that I've been bleeding every single day since I got an IUD inserted three months ago. <laughs> so do I still hate my body? Yes, but at the same time, I'm so grateful for this meat sack that lets me run and jump and pet soft things and do cartwheels and grass and hug the people I love. I've put her through a lot, yet she's still here for me. I have hope that one day I'll be able to sit with myself in this vessel with old scars and dark spots and rough patches and make peace. Oh.